you've transcended a liminal threshold into history fuzz. A realm of contemplative inquiry in which leading researchers discuss the motivations, tools and skills of the sky watchers, surveyors, architects and builders who delineated monumental landscapes with awe-inspiring structures enshrining their diverse cosmic chronicles in stone. I'm your host, Ashley Cowie. You can unlock videos, maps, articles, and enjoy early ad-free new episodes by becoming a member on HistoryFuzz.com, where you can also apply to join our team exploring and filming archaeology documentaries in the Andean highlands of Colombia. In the last episode, my guest referred to the Chaco Meridian, a north to south alignment in the southwestern United States marked by ancestral Pueblan power centers. Following that thread, herein I speak with Stephen Lexon, a professor of anthropology and curator of archaeology at the Museum of Natural History at the University of Colorado, Boulder who currently serves as contributing editor for Archaeology magazine. Stephen has led over 20 archaeological excavations in the monumental landscapes of the Southwest, and he's written 12 books including his controversial 1999 work, The Chaco Meridian, in which he proposed the existence of a deliberate North to South alignment marked by a series of Casas Grandes, or great houses. The professor shares his entrapping story of a mid 13th century group of social elites living at Aztec ruins in northwestern New Mexico who extended their ancestral alignment over 600 kilometers southwards, where they founded Casas Grandes, or Paquime, in northern Mexico. And while some archaeologists contest this long-distance meridional alignment, in this discussion, Stephen doubles down, suggesting it was perhaps extended 700 kilometers south of Pakime, terminating at Culiacan in northwestern Mexico. It's time to hunt for astral cartography in the high desert of northwestern New Mexico with Professor Stephen Lexon. Chaco Canyon uh, is now a World Heritage Site. It's a uh, Native American site in northwest New Mexico uh, in amongst the modern Pueblo Indians. They don't live there now, but they're in the Arizona and New Mexico all, all around the edges of where, where Chaco was. And it's a national park. Like I say, it's a World Heritage Site. Um, because of um, six or eight uh, very, very large, spectacular masonry buildings, that the jargon is Great House, capital G, capital H, Great Houses, um, that are to our eyes, to European eyes, um, sort of the pinnacle of ancient architecture, native architecture in, in the indigenous Southwest. Um, I will get into this at some point, what Pueblo people think about the place, Aye. which is problematic, but, um, they're very compelling buildings, and they've, for decades, have figured in world histories of architecture and uh, straight architectural history uh, um, and theoretical architectural uh, writings and uh, musings. Um, archaeologically, um, Chaco probably was the key historical event in the history of the Pueblo, various Pueblo people. When I say Pueblo people, there's 20 different Pueblos, and they speak six to seven different languages. And each individual village, uh, there are settled village farmers, and the Spanish call them Pueblos because that was their word for a settled community. Uh, it was an administrative term. But when we took over the South, when we, when the United States takes over the Southwest, takes over New Mexico, we take it from Mexico in 1848, we changed that administrative term to a sort of faux ethnic identity that you guys are all Pueblos. And they, 
they certainly recognize commonalities, uh, both social and philosophical and ideological. But like I said, they, they speak different languages and they have lots of, you know, they're as much different as they are. Well, that's an exaggeration, but they certainly are, uh, you know, 20 individual Pueblos. And again, in each Pueblo, there's some are multiple villages. Each village is different and each clan in each village has its own history. So anyway, Chaco, in terms of how archaeologists understand Pueblo history, Chaco is probably the pivotal event. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, certainly all the Pueblos, you know, it's a national, like it's a World Heritage Site, it's a national park. All the Pueblos are very concerned with and interested in Chaco, and most of them have stories about it, and all the stories are pleasant. Mm. Uh, but they all feel very uh, protective of Chaco, and this has come out lately because there's a lot of energy development around Chaco Canyon. It's out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's, Nav it's Navajo country. It's not like nobody lives there. The Navajo people who are different Indians, Native Americans, than the Pueblo people, they live there now. And uh, there's energy development that has uh, been proposed for around Chaco Canyon that has pit the local Navajo people who look to profit from that. And they're all, you know, they need money. I mean, you can't deny that Navajo people are wonderful people, but they aren't rich. And the Pueblos don't want it, the Navajos do want it. So it's just a bone of contention even today over Chaco. And, and the Navajos have lots of stories about Chaco too. Maybe we'll get into that. But they're also not pleasant stories. Tell me when the first signs of inhabitation appear. Are, and also, is there anything prehistoric back in the eight to 10,000 BC? Was there any signs of archaic? They had to be out there. There's not, it's not famous for Paleo-Indian sites. It's not famous for the next time period, which is archaic, big long time period. Uh, Chaco really kicks in in, uh, I'll use some jargon here, basket maker three. And in the Southwest, we have a series of periods uh, that I'll, probably be using the basket maker three, then it goes to Pueblo one, Pueblo two, Pueblo three, Pueblo four, Pueblo five. We cooked up those time periods, 1927, I think, and a lot before I was in the game. And we argue about them and we tweak them, but those guys back in 1927 were pretty smart. And the, what they were seeing in the material culture and the pottery and the architecture did change in those blocks of time. So the, the, period, the periods are still useful. We still use them. Uh, so Chaco really kicks in at Basque Maker 3, which is about 500 AD. So it's not terribly old. It's, uh, you know, I go out there with tourists from the old countries, <laughs> say, look, this is built in 1000 AD. And they say, my home is built in 1000 AD. So, you know, for, uh, in a global scale, it's not a, mm. of great antiquity. Does it look like an immigration inwards or were there technological developments on a culture that were already there? You know, people there, there's probably never a time when there's nobody in Chaco, but there are times when they're so thin on the ground that archaeology can't see them, and they're, but there are probably people out there. Um, in Basket Maker 3, 500 to 700 AD, which is when the whole thing really kicks off, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of settlement before that. I mean, it's not like there's nobody there, but then all of a sudden, in those couple of centuries, there's everybody under the sun. It's in Chaco. It's the biggest Basket Maker 3 site we know of in the whole Southwest. Mm -hmm you know, by orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude, probably. And then they go away. And, and, and probably what follows Basket Maker 3, this doesn't make any sense, but what follows Basket Maker 3 is Pueblo 1. In Pueblo 1, there's a few people out there, but not many. It's just never quite abandoned. But the big Pueblo, the huge Pueblo 1 conglomeration is elsewhere. And we'll get to that because it's due north of Chaco. In Pueblo 2, that Pueblo 1 thing goes away. It's 60 miles to the north. And it, it burst on the scene. South of the town of Durango in Colorado, and again, due north of Chaco. Before Pueblo 1, there was no Basket Maker 3 there. After Pueblo 1, there's no Pueblo 2 there. There's just this influx of people in that area uh, to make the biggest Pueblo 1 site anywhere. Then it goes away. You come back down to Pueblo 2, that's the glory days of Chaco. That's the, you know, the 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, when they build all these big buildings. And all of a sudden, I mean, it's not that there's nobody there, but it's all of a sudden the springs out of Locally, nowhere. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay. Archaeology is greatly based on what is recovered from the waste middens surrounding the stone buildings. Yeah. Referring to the waste middens in Jackal Canyon, how many people were estimated to have lived there when it was thriving? This isn't based on quantities of waste middens. This would be based on architecture, but on the 
criteria of architecture, I think about 2,500 to 3,000. And be, the, people's estimates for Chaco are all over the map. I mean, you know, some people say only a couple hundred people. Some people say 10,000. I say 2,500. How can you possibly date the architecture as accurate as you could date an organic food stuff? What's going on there? How can you date the architecture? We're extraordinarily fortunate in the Southwest to have tree rings um, where you can date the year the beam was cut. It doesn't necessarily mean that's when they built the building, but if you get a, a ceiling that is, and it, there's lots of wood at Chaco, it's over timbered. I mean, it's just like flagrant use of wood. If they didn't have, they'd bring it in 60 miles of wood. But you get a ceiling full of 1088 dates, okay? Either somebody went up in the mountains and cut a whole bunch of stuff in 1088, let it dry and stuff, and brought it down, you know, a few years later. That building went up at around 1088. And we really get, you know, those streaming dates, we get right to the year. Why would 2,500 people require such an enormous urban development? I mentioned that the Chaco is a national park because of these great houses, these very big, very formal, very expensive, almost monumental structures. That's not what most people are living in. Most people, that's where the 1% lives. Okay, the 99% are living in... And this is not just Chaco, it's just all over the Four Corners area, which is New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, Utah. Mm -hmm. They live in five little rooms in a pit structure out front. So you get five little rooms and then a pit structure out in front of it that we variously call a kiva, but it's a, they've been living in pit houses for a thousand years before, oh, six or 700 years before Chaco. And that's what most, that's what normal people live in. That's a commoner house. And what the architecture is telling you at Chaco, and it's fairly unambiguous. I mean, it's, even though not everybody buys into this, I mean, it's really quite clear. You have two classes of people. You have people living in the great houses where you have a huge palace with a few hundred people in it, maybe. Mm. And then all these little sites on the other side of the canyon where each one is a family, extended family, probably 10 people, something like that. But they're small. You can take one of those little unit pueblos, and that's our jargon for it is a unit pueblo because uh, some guy recognized the pattern in the 1930s. So this is a, uh, a unit that I'm seeing all over. And, oh, yeah, I can see it too. You can take one of those little unit pueblos, which is where the commoners live, and fit it in a single room at Pueblo Benito. And the scalar differences are enormous. And, of course, the technological differences are huge. Uh, the unit pueblos, I'm sure they loved them dearly and they were a nice home. But, you know, you lean on a wall wrong, they fall down. You'd have to be living in them and taking care of them after every rainstorm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The great pueblos, uh, the great houses, they invested so much uh, labor in building those that they're still standing. I mean, the unit pueblos, when you, you have to be an archaeologist to see them. If you walk across them, it's a few shirts, a couple of rocks sticking up. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not impressive archaeological sites. They're really cool, but they're not impressive. The great houses, you know, they're still standing five stories. I'd like to look at the architectural formatting, adherences to the cardinal points of the compass or indeed deviations from it that you find concurrent throughout the disparate or distant buildings? The, the great houses have a history, like Pueblo Benito, which is the biggest one. It's a big D-shaped thing that is sort of the icon for Chaco. It took them a few centuries to build that. It was built over a length of time. Um, later on, uh, you know, it starts in the eight, late 800s. It, go, it ends up in 1125, something like that. Later on, they build great big buildings all at once. They're not as big as Pueblo Benito, but again, they, you know, they're doing them in 10 years. And, and the orientations in the 9th century and early 10th century, the orientations of these buildings are, and this goes for the unit pueblos as well, sort of, they're facing sort of southeast, south-southeast, sort of back walls, sort of be solstice, kind of. Mm. Well, at some point in Chaco, some clever lad or labs, uh, Decides they're going to do cardinal building. You know, they, they, there's this long tradition of doing this. I think it's, sol, you know, it's solstice oriented, even though the, it's facing southeast. Um, and all of a sudden, you get these buildings that are north, south, east, west. Like I don't know if you remember the edge of sketch when you're, yeah, I mean, like they're designed on an edge of sketch, sort of, um, with long, long walls, uh, mostly going east, west. I mean, they're, yeah, they, they're oriented against south. They go from southeast to southwest at the south. Uh, but the orientation very clearly is, is uh, cardinal. And that may be the, the main archaeoastronomy at Chaco. We may come back to this. That I've certainly talked to some good archaeoastronomers and say that the only real archaeoastronomy out there is 
the north-south wall of Pueblo Benito. You can see it play out at Pueblo Benito, uh, which again took centuries. You know, they, they'd add a big bunch, and they'd add a big bunch, and they'd add a big bunch. Alta is sort of a master plan with a curve. It's a big D-shaped thing. The clever lad you referred to back there, I love that because that's what happened in these cultures. There was an above average IQ baby was born who decided, let's true things up here. Let's get cardinal. And it happened around that time, yeah. medieval era, where order was really being derived from the chaos. Yeah. But I'd like to ask you about the D shape in particular at Pueblo Bonito, because, you know, if an actual astronomer back in the day was standing on a clear field site that had been leveled, prepared, yeah. the channels cut, the foundations laid, putting a stake in the ground and monitoring the passing of that shadow, it's, it is a curve that's monitored. You know, you derive your square from the circle, if you like. Mm -hmm. And you almost wonder if um, the, there's a, an actual spot somewhere where a pole may have been erected in front of the D. Yeah. It's a historical fact that the, in the ninth century, all the great houses, and at that point there's only three of them, are built with a curve, but not necessarily an arc, if that makes sense. I mean, they're, they're not nearly as formal. Different ellipses. Half an ellipse. Well, yeah, yeah. So in the heart of Pueblo Benito, uh, the first building there, and this is late 800s, early 900s, is one of those great houses that looks sort of like a unit Pueblo, only scaled up by a factor of 10. I mean, you know, they're, they're doing basically the same ground plans, but just scaled way up. And where a unit Pueblo, the walls at the unit Pueblo, which is the commoner houses, couldn't go two stories tall. I mean, they're just they're not built for that. Mm -hmm. At Pueblo Benito, they tried to build this sucker three stories tall with masonry that wasn't, you know, wasn't designed for that. So it, it failed. Uh, and this is uh, excavations that were done in the 30s. Uh, they found the heart of Pueblo Benito where the back wall had started to fail and it actually hinged out. And instead of just letting it go, which is what they would have done anywhere else, you know, re recycling the stone, they enveloped it with better masonry build a lot of cross walls, buttresses, to keep that sucker from falling down. So they, they wanted to preserve the original building. It was a very important building. And then, but when Benito grows, it grows as the arc. They add to the arc. They add to the arc. And so it isn't a perfect semicircle. You know, it's, it's a distorted semicircle. Okay. So as far as usage is concerned, do these great houses have commonalities to suggest they served a purely ceremonial function or were they lived in? They're lived in. They're great houses. And that, that term is correct. These things are anywhere else in the world, you call them palaces, but you can't get away with that in the Southwest because uh, Pueblos don't have palaces. They don't have any of this stuff. Uh, you had nobles and commoners, which in the 11th century, every agricultural society north of Panama almost had nobles and commoners. That was just how people lived. And all through Mesoamerica, but also even hunters and gatherers out in California has a Shumash, but definite nobles and definite commoners. And in Florida, you had uh, the Calusa, who they didn't grow corn. You know, if they wanted corn, they got the boys together and went went inland and stole it from you know, took it from from the, the corn farmers. But they they when the Spanish come in, uh, the Shumash, uh, the Calusa are still there. And yeah, they have nobles being carried around and pelicans, and you know if the if the commoners look at them, the commoners die. I mean, you know, like the, or killed. I mean, well, well, I don't think that actually happened much, but that's what that's what was recorded. This, you know, these are really two classes of people. It's ubiquitous in North North America. I mean, it's uh, would be a kind of remarkable. Certainly at Cahokia, if you talk to Tim Pocket, I mean, they got two classes of people that were more. He's a very well respected senior scholar in archaeology. I mean, this is this is, he's currently runs the. Illinois State Archaeological Survey or something, but for a long time he was a professor. And he and I have done a lot of work together. Uh, very smart young man. I can give you his contact information. Excellent. Thank you so much. In contemporary Moisca, Colombia, there's a site about 50 miles outside Bacata or Bogota. Archaeologists know that Ubate, the site, was visited every 64 years of the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. And the last Moisca ceremony was held on that. I think it's called the Grand Conjunction. Hmm. Do you think Chaco Canyon is perhaps something like that, where it's a ceremonial site, but maybe not just for the nobles of the valley, but for a far greater expanse? Do you think so or not? 
Yeah, and that, that model's been proposed uh, by a number of different people. That's a pilgrimage center. Have there been any devices, earthenware pipes, or chemical residue from psychotropic drug use in Chaco? Not to my knowledge. I mean, uh, there there are cylinder jars at Pueblo Benito, uh, a couple hundred of them. It's just not for the 10,000 people that might have come in there. But uh, Patricia Crown down at the University of New Mexico figured out that they're for chocolate. Ah, okay. Uh, and the other, the other drug that's been suggested, and this is a link to Cahokia in the Mississippi Valley, is back there they have Yapan Holly uh, made into a beverage they called a black drink that was incredibly highly caffeinated. So it wasn't your morning pick-me-up, it was your morning knock-you-out. I mean, you drink this stuff and you get ill and you see stuff, whatever, you know, you, it, and it's part of ceremonial use. Patty Crown has also suggested that there may be remains of the black drink of the Alpen Holly residues at Chop. But again, she's finding this, we ought to talk to her, but uh, she's finding this in the great houses. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, maybe not all 60,000 people or 80,000 people are in Chaco's region. But there's roads, you know, uh, there are things we call roads that radiate out from Chaco like spokes on a wheel. And they, they're roads. I mean, they're 10 meters wide and cut and fill. And, you know, they, they get to a cliff and they beat stairs in the cliff or, or build a ramp. So you're saying these are deliberately straight roads where they're coming through cliff faces rather than bending or deviating. Yeah. These sound like the ceremonial roads of South America whereby you can have six Pueblos and you can quite clearly see on Google Earth the the route that follows the river or goes the easiest route between two hills. Yeah. But Simon Cobo, 1614, a Spanish chronicler in Colombia said that for so many leagues, the straight holy roads ran that it looked as if a priest had rolled out a ribbon for as far as the eye could see. Yeah. Tell me why you think there was an adherence to straight roads ceremonially. Uh, the North Road is, for sure. Well, you have to get back to the North Road in a minute. It goes out of Chaco and goes straight north. With the acquisition of LIDAR data at this point, we're finding more and more and more roads. And uh, again, Rich Friedman or, or Rob Weiner could tell you more about that. But I, I guess you got together with, with uh, Rob Weiner and Rich Friedman. Yes, thank you so much. They Sometimes, sometimes they go, uh, they'll often go to other communities where there's a smaller great house and a bunch of commoner houses. But some of them just go to um, landscape features, you know, a very prominent butte. Mm. So, yeah, they, they, they're some sort of marking on the ground, both a political structure and an ideological structure, I think. I mean, the normal way for these guys to build a trail uh, when they get to a cliff, a little hand and toe holds, you know, that, that are pretty scary looking. To, well, of course, they've been eroding for a thousand years, but, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is some admirable agility <laughs> people. But, you know, it's a regular trail. It's a, a one-person wide hand and toe hold. And you'll have a, a road stairway, have a road stairway over here, and, you know, half a kilometer away, you'll have hand and toe holds that are probably contemporary. So, you know, the the day-to-day the -day traffic is probably following the routes of less resistance, you know, going along the, or where there's water or whatever. The roads are just going, you know, we, we want to go from here to our you want to build something that goes from here to there. Yeah. And whether we actually go from here to there, I, I don't know. Now, there's a famous claim in the Chaco Canyon about this. You'd have to remind me of the name of the hill. It's the furthest outlier to the northeast. Oh, uh, Chimney chimney Rock. Can one standing on Chimney Rock see the moon rising behind the rock on its maximum declination every 18.6 years or not? Oh, yeah, it's spectacular. I was, I've worked at Chimney Rock. I got a chance to work there in 2009, not, which was not a standstill year, but, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kim Malville, who is a friend and a colleague at the University of Colorado, uh, is the uh, astronomer, astrophysicist who, uh, no sure recognized this possibility. And I was in the neighborhood doing some business with the Southern Utes. I can't remember what, you know, I was down at their reservation, probably getting yelled at. I don't know, but, uh, hmm. Kim was leading a tour. Uh, down to Chimney Rock because that was, it's not a single day. It lasts for weeks, I think, or, or, or a number of days. Uh, I decided to treat myself to joining this tour up to Chimney Rock, a place I knew fairly well anyway, and watch this happen. And I became a believer. <laughs> it's really quite, quite remarkable. Yeah. There are two 
pillars, uh, natural, uh, huge sandstone pillars that are actually like that. But from the great house, there's a great house up there, Chaco Great House. You stand at the great house and they look like this and the moon is my head coming up. Yeah. Really something. Again, was it using the tree timbers, perhaps, where they noted that the great house had been inhabited every 18.6 years, then abandoned, then back, then abandoned three times, I believe? and then That was our work. That came out of our work. Oh, really? Uh, the, yeah, the initial excavations there um, were before tree rings, as in the 1920s. But then the University of Colorado went down there and did some more work and got all kinds of dates from, I believe, it was 1076. Mm. You know, just lots of dates and from the, the two rooms that they dug. And whatever whatever year it was, it was a standstill year. So we went back and did some more work at the, at the request of the Forest Service because it's, it belongs to the Forest Service and got 1076 dates, but also had older beams that clearly were being used in construction from earlier buildings being reused in these you know in these rooms that were built 1076. Mm. And I don't recall, but I think we had like f not many of them. We had like six cutting dates in that that were earlier and. Four of them or five of them were standstill dates, lunar dates, you know, and not, no others. <laughs> you know, it's, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, um, there's there's something to that. There were buildings there or there were, you know, additions to the building. Again, all these great houses, some of them go up all at once. Most of them, they, you know, they build a block and a block and a block, maybe something like that. That brings me on to the, or back to this thing you've been teasing, this Great North Road. I'm dying to talk to you about this. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to lay out what the Great North Road is before I start getting into it because I took the liberty to to measure the Great North Road mm -hmm. and to have a look at what the variances are and that allows us to make maybe some conclusions as to what it's not and what it is. But if you could describe what the Great North Road is. Um, the North Road coming out of Chaco doesn't come out of a specific building. There's a, a network of roads in Chocolates. Several of these shorter segments come together and then the North Road shoots north out of there uh, for about 40, 50 miles, I think. Uh, and from where it starts in Chaco to where it, it, it doesn't end, but it, it uh, hits a canyon called Coots Canyon. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say this, that from Chaco up to Coots Canyon, it's sort of rolling plains country. There's some, some breaks, but, uh, you know, it's mostly flattish. You get to Coots Canyon and the world drops away. I mean, it's a, a badland canyon, you know, quite spectacular, but, you know, it's just got pretty worthless in terms of people, except for oil. There's a lot of oil down there. <laughs> but, okay, so the road goes to Coots Canyon, goes north to Coots Canyon, and I'll return to that. Uh, where it hits Coots Canyon, it's it's only a few hundred meters off uh, east-west from where it started in Chaco. I'll have to say at this point that I don't give a lot of credence to these claims for remarkable precision. I, I think that the fact that it's that close, they didn't know that. Okay, they didn't know that. The fact that it's that close is because they had to reestablish north every time they lost their backsight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many segments were... They couldn't look back. They were going over a small, slight ridge. I mean, it's a rolling country going a slight ridge. Every time you reestablish north, there's air. You know, as long as the errors are small and random, they self-correct. Which Pueblo or Casa Grande represents ground zero? Where do you think the staff was first driven into the ground with the north alignment as a deliberation? Where do you think the staff was first driven into the ground with the north alignment as a deliberation? That would be Chaco Canyon and Basket Maker 3 at 500 AD when you had this enormous Basket Maker site there that no one knows why. The site at that time is like eight miles long. <laughs> uh, this is, the, again, this Basket Maker 3 period, which is a bad jargon, but, you know, 500... So it's the first big thing that happens at Chaco, and it's huge for, for the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, you have a normal site of that time period is one pit house, and maybe with a you know a little stockade around it or something, and or two pit houses or something like that. A couple of families. And if you find a basket maker site with ten pit houses, you write a book and retire. Well, it's Chaco at one end of the canyon. There's a hundred room, a hundred pit house basket maker site. At the other end of the canyon, there's a hundred pit house site 
and, and there's this basket maker pottery underneath all those later buildings in between. So God only knows what was in between them, but you know, it's, but it's almost a continuous settlement. Mm. Where along that line, probably under Pueblo Benito, I don't know, uh, you know, because there's ba- there are basket when they dug Pueblo Benito, which is a great house, biggest great house. Uh, when they went below the plaza, there's basket maker sites or, or pinhouse. She's, but we don't know how extensive. In some of the presentations I've seen online, the Chaco Meridian is presented from Aztec in the north, covering Chaco Canyon and terminating on Casas Grandes. Yeah. Would you agree that this is perhaps an, a meridian derived from cultural mythology more so than the necessity to keep time? Um, I th- I'd add a political element to it, too. Uh, you know, at Chaco, the old way of orienting buildings where they face the southeast was the first that was the fundamental canon for for chocolate building and then somebody got frisky and they started doing cardinal and the next thing you know they're doing a meridian and i don't think the meridian i mean this may be disappointing to you but i don't think it's a meridian i think it's they're moving north and if you move north consistently you wind up with something that looks like a meridian then they turn and move south and if you do that consistently you're going to wind up being north south of each other i'm not sure they knew they didn't have a clue what the, what the longitude of Casas Grandes was compared to chocolate, they didn't know. So what we're looking at here should be called a north to south alignment with cultural significance. It's not an astronomer's prime meridian. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Absolutely. So what is this great significance that was placed in the north? The north as a geographical area, but also as a concept, north as a concept, the fixed north. Well, from the astronomical or archaeoastronomical perspective here, everybody gets excited because Chaco could tell the solstices. And I'm sitting there thinking, these guys are farmers. They've been on the land for a thousand years. Can't tell the, you know, if you don't have a calendar, you're dead. I mean, there may well have been priests or, or officials, whatever, who paid attention to the calendar. And, and you know, the... Ritualized it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, for normal people who are farming, I mean, that's just life. <laughs> and I'm sure it was also ceremony. You know, th- th- these guys are probably agriculture probably is a ceremony. I mean, they're praying, they're doing they, that's what they do today anyway. But uh, okay, so so everybody knew about the solstice. Maybe not everybody knew about uh, the lunar stuff because that's you know 18 years. It's, that's that's a that's a lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it t- takes several lifetimes of observation and passing it down before anybody recognizes the pattern. But they've been there for 10,000 years. So somebody, you know, everybody knew a chimney rock, for example. Everybody knew that that happened. I'm sure. And then Chaco builds a great house and takes it over. But uh, everybody also knows north. You know, Pueblo's called the heart of the sky. Every night you can see it, you know, see it twirl around the heart of the sky. So everybody knows that, but it has no calendrical value. Mm-hmm. It has no economic value. It has no practical value. And I think Chaco, one of the things they did um, when they're fighting about, are we going to have the old orientation of buildings or this north, south, east, west stuff? North, south, east, west one, and they they sort of capture that. They say that's ours now. You know that that's the ideology of the ruling class that we control north. Now that we don't control north. Everybody, everybody knows about it. It's just that nobody, and they probably wonder about it. We are masters of the center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And I, well, and this is the stories that the Navajos and the Pueblos tell about Chaco too. Is that you had people living in those houses who were not very nice people, mm. uh, and they subjugated everyone else. And this is especially the Navajo. They have detailed stories about this, uh, that uh, people live in those houses, I'm quoting here, uh, enslaved everyone, the Pueblo people, the Navajo people, everybody, and made them build houses. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they they carved the labor and made them, made them build houses. The Pueblos don't tell that story, but the Pueblos don't really talk about Chaco because, I mean, I, this is a quote again from Pueblo people in the Rio Grande. They say, we know all about Chaco. We don't talk about it because bad things happen there. You said this right at the beginning before we even started, and you said, I'll come back to it, because I'd love for you to go into that and tell me what you think was going on there. Well, I'm not Navajo, and I'm not a Pueblo person. And like I mentioned, there's many, many different Pueblos, uh, and they all have different stories. You have seen the evidence of what did and didn't happen there. I, I, I think the, the, what the archaeology is showing us and what the Native people are saying are very congruent. Um, the, even the fact that the Pueblos don't want to talk about Chaco, because bad stuff happened there. There's one story from Acoma Pueblo where they were living in a place called White House. It was wonderful. They had, you know, it was, they had everything. It was just a flashy place. It was like Oz, you know, it was wonderful. But the people started misbehaving and people got power over people and that isn't the right thing. 
And so they, the, they abandon some of the people there who are behaving badly and they head south, <laughs> which may be metaphorical, maybe, but after the, after everything's in force, after, after four days, everything's in force, after four days, they stop and they have a ceremony of forgetting, right? They're going to, they're going to blot that out. They're never going to do that again because it sucked. I mean, it, it was really bad. And then that is borne out by the archaeology and by other Native American stories. Uh, it was, you know, a rough place and it ended very badly. Aye. The thing is, they didn't forget, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be telling the story. So they don't talk about it. They bring out, this is, okay, this is me and a couple of other people tell, agreeing with this, that they bring out these stories when somebody needs to hear them. You know, if somebody's getting uppity or somebody's not behaving communally, the pueblos are famously communal and take care of each other. And, you know, you aren't supposed to make more money than somebody, or if you do, you're supposed to share, whatever. If somebody's not behaving that way, they'll bring these stories out and say, last time we tried this, some jerk like you did this kind of stuff, and look what happened. Uh, Rob Weiner can tell you more about this, but the Navajos live out there, and they have strong memories of Chaco, and we say they weren't there at the time, but I think they probably were. Uh, anyway, they, they're very specific about it. The, the way the uh, elites, the nobles, establish themselves is by gambling, and they, they enslave everybody through gambling because uh, they always win. Okay, so this is probably more than you need for your podcast, but no, I like I know the mob founded Vegas, but you're about to tell me that the mob founded Chaco Canyon. <laughs> yeah, 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 pretty much. Uh, well, I was talking to some Navajo guys. I was down in Window Rock, which is the capital Navajo Nation, on some other business, and I was interested because Navajo Tribe Nation is famously entrepreneurial. I mean, if they can make money for the people, they'll they'll cut timber, they'll mine coal, whatever, whatever works up to up to certain limits. And uh, in my lifetime, you know, in the last couple of decades, the native tribes in the Southwest and elsewhere in the United States have gotten the right to open casinos, gambling casinos. And all these Pueblos up and down the Rio Grande have gambling casinos and some of them make money, some of them don't. But Navajos never get into it. And I was asking this guy who was the working with, I think he was the head of the cultural preservation group there in the old branch of the government. Mm. How come you guys didn't get into this? You're, you're into everything else. And he says, the old people wouldn't let us. Well, what's up with that? He says, the old people wouldn't let us. They remember what happened to Chaco. And that was so traumatic. You know, they remember that, like, uh, uh, the more recent horrible things that happened to the Navajos that we did uh, with, you know, sending concentration camps and stuff. And so it was just as dramatic as Bosque Redondo, which is when we, we took all the Navajos and tried to put them in a, a camp. I said, it's just that traumatic. And so we had to wait for the old people to die <laughs> you know, that, that would let us go. And, you know, he's, he's probably thinking of specific people in the government because they have a very structured government. Uh, but now they have casinos. But I thought that, you know, that's, that's some kind of evidence there where they could have been making money off of this, but the old stories aren't just stories. In my research before talking to you, I came across a central myth about the, the character, the god the, or the demigod called the gambler. Yeah who did some atrocious things to his people, just as you've said. But this is the key the key line. I thought, ooh, that's interesting. The people, once they had beat him up, they fired him to the south. And I thought, is that some kind of mythological reference to our meridian? I think so. Where did he land? That's what we need to know. <laughs> Casas Grandes. Um, you need to talk to Rob Weiner about this. This was his whole dissertation was working on Navajo and stuff. A, a week tomorrow, I've got Rob. Okay. Well, he's he, he's gotten into this in much more detail. Okay. Most of what I'm saying to you is stuff I picked up on my own, but some of it I'm sure is colored by what I've heard from Rob. Uh, yeah. Well, in one version, I mean, there's different versions. Everybody has different versions of the story, apparently. But in one version, the great gambler, um, they cut off his head and bury him under a rock. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in another version... Another version, you know, they wrap him up on an arrow, a giant arrow, and shoot him straight south back to where he came from. Uh -huh. <laughs> where did he get fired from, Steve? Do you, can you tell me, where was that legend based? Do you know, does it have a home? Uh, ask Rob, but the Navajos I worked with in Chaco, so the Pueblo Alto, where I got to work when I was younger, was the great gambler's home. And and there's, there's a, yeah, it's up on top. It, it's you know, it's, it's where the North Road starts. Oh, see, there you go. So there's, this is it. We must draw a direct alignment south from Pueblo Alto to see. Well, a uh, guy named John Fritz, who's gone on to do a lot of archaeostronomy work in, in uh, 
the subcontinent in India. Uh, he noted that Pueblo Alto, where again, where I got the work, was due north of Sinclatsen on the south. Uh, Chaco is a valley. Pueblo Alto is on top here. Sinclatsen's on top there, and then Benito is in the middle. Okay. Uh, down low. and But there's a north-south line that connects those. Wonderful. I think that's your, the guy being shot on the arrow right there. Pueblo Alto is built in the 1020s. You know, it's after Chaco gets started. So it's actually when it explodes in 1020s, 1030s. But I excavated the central rim block, part, part of it, small part of the central rim block, uh, the very middle part of Pueblo Alto, not knowing any of these stories. And we got, we got underneath the, uh, the building from 1020s, and there was an earlier building. Wow. <laughs> you know, from the 900s. <laughs> small, but again, uh, built like the great houses with great wide walls and that sort of thing, but only probably six or seven rooms. So there's something up there. And there's probably, probably something under St. Clemson, or north south. Are there any monuments marking any of these astronomical alignments? Yeah, there's uh, a variety of what they call roadside architecture. The guys that worked on the Chocolate Roads and Rich Friedman can tell you about this, but shrines, little C-shaped shrines, things like that. But also like on the North Road, every 20 miles or so, there's a great small great house. They're in places where no one is right mind to try and farm. Yeah. And you know, it's there because the road is there. I must ask you about sustainability. Was there an area of agriculture that's missing and hasn't been identified yet? Or is this a culture who were so rich or they imported everything? I think they imported everything, but there are two views here. Most of us think Chaco was a terrible place to farm. And I go back to the Navajo people who were actually living there or trying to live there until we chased them off. And I talked to a historian, a Navajo, at most, how many Navajos ever lived in this canyon? Two, three hundred, mm. you know, they support. And most of those guys had farms someplace else, too. They, would, they weren't betting all on Chaco because Chaco is pretty rough. Mm -hmm. So I think they're importing a lot of food. Uh, there's a guy named Chip Wills, Work Wills. He's a professor at the University of New Mexico who has convinced himself that no, Chaco is. And he's, he's got some data to back this up. Chaco was back in the day, not a bad place to farm. Uh, again, I don't think most of us believe that, but but there is an argument to be made. It's not a, not a spurious argument. There's an argument to be made from data that it was a better place to farm than, than we think it was. But I think that, yeah, I think they're bringing in all kinds of stuff. They don't make, they're making their own pottery. You know, all the pottery out there, most of it anyway, is being made where there's wood. <laughs> there's no wood in Chaco. You know? <laughs> if somebody says that it was perhaps better for agriculture than one thinks, wouldn't that person have the responsibility to show a system of irrigation ditches and wells? Well, there, there are features that have been interpreted as irrigation ditches, not wells. The initial work on this was done by a guy named Gwen Vivian uh, in the 60s. And irrigation is very popular then because of a guy named Carl Wittfogel wrote a book that called Oriental Despotism. is all about irrigation. And so Gwen, bless his heart, who's very, a very smart guy. He's gone now, unfortunately, but uh, he, he saw all these lines and said, oh, those are all, this is a big irrigation system. And he was good. He's a good scholar. You know, about 10 years later, he said, no, because <laughs> they, they run uphill <laughs> they they, and they don't connect to any water source or anything. He said, no, they're roads. Mm -hmm. But there are features on the canyon floor that appear to be uh, canals, small canals. Uh, the, the issues where they're getting their water, you know, the Chaco really is, it's not a nice place. Um, so where might they have imported foods from? Where's the first sign of huge agriculture that could maybe have sustained the people using the ceremonial site in Chaco? Chaco's in the middle of what's called the San Juan Basin, which is a geological basin, but it, it also is a top topographic basin. Uh, and it's really in a spot that most of us think is not real good for growing corn. All around the edges of that are mountains and water. You know, you have the Chusca Mountains to the to the west, and that's where all the Navajos live now. <laughs> and there's streams coming down, and they have these big irrigated fields. Mm -hmm. To the south is Lobo Mesa. To the north is uh, San Juan River. I mean, all the water is out at the edge of this thing. That's that, and that's where the you know Chaco is the center of this. And there's roads going into Chaco from all those different directions. How far afield are the artifacts identified as coming from? Pretty far. I mean, uh, think about construction timbers. I mean, there there's no wood at Chaco. There's certainly by the 11th century, there's no stick out there. It's all been, you know, been used. So they're bringing in, you know, a quarter of a million large beams. These are not small. I mean, they're not telephone poles, but they're, they're big. Mm -hmm. 
uh, from the Chisco Mountains and from the San Juan Mountains and, you know, like 60 miles on, on, and they're carrying them. I mean, they don't have beasts of burden. They don't have animals. Uh, people are hauling these things in, 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 in large quantities. I mean, just the organizing the labor for the great houses is something we haven't talked about, but it's, it's not minor. It's not minor. Yet the big question is the organization of labor force, not to mention who fed them, yeah. clothed them, provided for them, did their job when they weren't at home providing for the family. Yes. Do you think it was surely a case of this was such an important ceremonial center that people, I mean, may, may have devoted their lives in service to maintaining and expanding the site? Yeah, I, I don't think it was cheerful. I mean, I don't think people were coming in there and, and contributing labor because it's all together now. It's, you know, barn raising. Oh, really? So forced labor? No, I, I think it's like the Navajo stories. They're enslaved. Um, not, you know, not literally enslaved, but they, they owe a labor duty, a labor tax. Or, you know, so when you turn 18 or when you turn 16, you got to go in and work for two months, build this guy's house. I, I mean, that was also a system in, in, in Mexico at that time that people owed tribute, you know, pottery, this, that, you know, not crushing tribute. But they owed labor to the nobles, and they'd have to come work on their fields and build them a house. But then they had, they had their lives back where they lived. I had a, quite a scattered image of the Chaco Canyon before this, but now what I've got is an image of a really dark cultish center where you would rather not be. That's certainly what I've heard from Indians, and that, you know the archaeological evidence. There's a certain amount of very unpleasant violence. Uh, by and large, it's a very peaceful time. You know, people in these commoner houses, they'll be scattered across the landscape. They're not circling the wagons or going up in the cliffs or any of that kind of stuff. There'll be a house here and you know, clomp two kilometers later, house there, house there. They're not worried, uh, but they should be. Is every once in a while, there's a mass execution. You know, uh, somebody's coming in and rounding up all the kids and the old folks and everybody in, in whatever that settlement is and cutting them up and, you know, nasty. And I, I suspect that it doesn't happen very often. I mean, archeolo archaeologically, I mean, you know, like 20 episodes of this stuff, but you probably didn't have to do it very often. You know, you're not paying your taxes. We're going to show everybody, everybody would know about it. You know, all across Northwest New Mexico, they'd know what happened. I've got two questions, one exceptionally dark and one, yeah, pretty gray. The first one is, has evidence of this violence been identified in the bones of people discovered? The second one is, were they eating each other, Steve? Uh, the evidence for this is, is from the archaeology where you dig a site and you come across a kiva or a room that's just full of chopped up people. Mm. And, you know, they, it's not just dead people. They they chop up the bones and they like they're jumping up and down on it. And pretty clearly, uh, there's a little cannibalism going on. But I don't think it's dietary cannibalism. I think it's, you know, the, the, the bully boys are out there, you know, and that's the final final indignity um keep bringing our trees in from 80 kilometers away or this might just happen to you well that's that's my take on it and it's something that's very troublesome as you might imagine to pueblo people you know it, it, it's yeah it's something that that it's like when it first when all this stuff first came out which is a long time ago in 1999 you know it was sort of seen as more indian bashing you're turning us into savages you know we, we have a long history of doing this to indian people mm. but at, at this point uh I think most folks admit that it happened, just don't want to talk about it. I went out to Hopi one time, Hopi Pueblo, uh, at the beginning of all this, and I was meeting with their cultural preservation team about something else all entirely. I don't remember what. And I walk into the room, and there's all these Hopi officials at one end of the room. And I knew some of them. And one of them says, you know, the leader of that group says, oh, we know all about that cannibalism. It wasn't us. <laughs> and, and like an idiot. Like an idiot, I, I changed the subject to what I was there to do instead of just saying, oh, <laughs> you know, please tell me more. But but yeah, I, I, the stories are there. They just don't want to talk about them. Um, and I don't blame them. So would you define these as mass graves? No. Oh. Bones just unceremoniously left behind? Yes, very deliberately, all, all jammed into a room or, you know, no, they're not graves. So it doesn't seem to be ritual. It just seems to be hyperviolence aside from ritual? Hyperviolence might be a ritual. Yes, 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 yes. I think it's organized, organized violence that's sort of state sanctioned. Um, it isn't like one village whacking each other. That happens towards the end. One village will whack another village. This is, this is some authority coming out and, and doing this to make a point. 
Now that you've coloured the culture that we're dealing with, I want to wheel back round to the Chaco Meridian. Yes. I want to ask you if you've surveyed it to the south, further south than Casas Grandes, or to the north, on the premise that so often Native American cultures aligned their sacred sites with chief mountains in the north. Well, the, the north-south alignments, um, you know, I published that in 1999, but in 2015, I published another book, you know, the second edition same book, where that north-south alignment, there's like uh, six of those periods, uh, Basket Maker 3, P1, P2, okay. For every one of those periods, biggest by far and the weirdest by far, and I can sort of back that up. I know that's a value judgment, but in uh, almost certainly the most important sites are on that north-south line. Mm-hmm. Every one of those. Um, it ends up down in Mexico. I mean, in, in Casas Grandes, but then even further south to Culiacan. Right, Steve. Why? They got lucky with Casas Grandes. Uh, Chaco, in my opinion, is a terrible place to go do all this stuff. I mean, it's not a good place to grow corn, in, my, in many others' opinion. They go north. They move north until they hit a nice creek and the Animus River, which is a nice little river. That's where they build Aztec. And when they go south, they, they pass through all kinds of country that's pretty worthless. When they finally get to where Casas Grandes is, it's a beautiful spot. It's on a nice little river uh, in Chihuahua uh, during the 19th century. That was the breadbasket of Mexico. I mean, you know, it, it, and then, then they had the revolutions and stuff. Bad stuff happened there. But um, yeah, it's a perfect spot. And, and I think they just kept going south until they hit the perfect spot. This is the place. You know, they, they bypassed a bunch of other places. Are there any outliers farther south than that? If you go south from Casas Grandes, you have to go over the Sierra Madres, the Taramara country, and it's rough country. And you wind up at Culiacan. And there is a number of reasons to be thinking that that's not an accident. Yes, yes. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt, does that name ring a bell? I know, he mapped Colombia. He recorded the Moisca myths here. Yeah. The, the Ice Age Lake here is Lake Humboldt after him. Yes, indeed. Well, he's quite a guy. Um, well, I love that guy. You know what? Imagine being a cartographer back in those days with a horse and a telescope. Well, goes through northern South America, comes back through Mexico City, you know, and stays in Mexico City for a few months working with the Royal Institute of, of Mining because this is while well, Mexico is still a Spanish colony. And every, you know, he's a famous guy already. And I'm sure every, and Mexico City was some, some deal at that point. I mean, that was the most cosmopolitan city in, in Americas. Mm-hmm. He has access to all these old maps at the Royal Institute because, you know, they caught, had pre Columbian maps, they had the early explorer maps. Yep. Anyway, he cranks out a map of the Southwest, which is pretty accurate. The, the latitudes are all really good. The longitudes suck because, you know, longitudes are hard to but you certainly recognize the features. And he never went to the Southwest. I mean, he's doing all this by compiling maps and having guys in Mexico City work with him. Because right? everybody's leaning over his shoulder. Anybody's anybody. You know, uh, the, the savants and the, the scholars and stuff, they're going to flock around this. Anyway, make long story short, on his map of the Southwest, which was compiled in Mexico City from Mexican sources, mm. he has you know, unequivocally, Casas Grandes, there's no question about that, and then he has a little little call in on the side and says, from whence, the Az- this is the last home of the Aztecs. He says, this is where the Aztecs came from. And that's a long story. But this last home of the Aztecs, from whence they went through the Tarahumara country to Culiacan. He, he, he spells it out. He has no idea that Culiacan is due south of Casas Grandes. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, for almost a thousand years, they've been bouncing up and down on this line. You know, this is the last pitch, and it's a hell of a pitch. You know, going over the Sierra Madres. You'd have to really want to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Culiacan is cool because it's when the Spanish come in, it's the furthest northwest thing they consider a city. Beyond Culiacan, that, that's it. That's the launch point for the Spanish. So what you're saying is Culiacan was established south on the Chaco Meridian. Uh, or it was there and the Meridian goes north from Culiacan. It's possible. When was Culiacan built? Uh, it really flowers right after Casas Grandes goes under but that's yeah yeah the uh, Casas Grandes ends and Culiacan goes up how many kilometers or miles away is Culiacan oh that's like six, 600 kilometers and it's horrible country it's mountains not horrible it's beautiful but but it's you know it's mountains and valleys and the Copper Canyon north to south east to west cardinally you can do it yeah but um 
I mean, you're never going to sell it to your colleagues that there was a deliberate alignment over 600 kilometers to the south. You're just not. No. doesn't matter what you provide. I'm going to go and see what the actual deviation is in that alignment. Yeah, modern Kuli Khan, when the Spanish come up, when Guzman comes up, he's the conquistador that messes that part of the world up. He takes Culiacan and then he reestablishes Culiacan a little further up the up the river, meaning to the east. So where modern Culiacan is is a little far east, and you know, up where the uh, native Culiacan was. Okay. I, I was thinking of doing work down there, just checking this out because it, it's great. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I admit this is quite a quite a claim. Um, but Culiacan is the head of the Sinaloa. That's where good. Uh, uh, El Chapo had ran the Sinaloa cartel. So I figured, you know, for a guy like I, me that looks like me, that doesn't speak Spanish real well, I'm probably not a good place to go poking around in cornfields. <laughs> so I, I've never been down there. Never Do it, down. but just don't be making any appointments soon after <laughs> it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's still rough country. It's a beautiful town, apparently, but it's, you know, you got to know, know people there. Do you think if I was to ask um, Rick about the this extended meridian, he would perhaps know something about that, or is this something within the refines of your own research and thoughts? Um, yeah, Friedman. Yeah, um, he's a very cautious guy. I've never had a conversation about Kuliakon and all this stuff. I, I think he's aware of it. Uh, he's he's probably going to hem and haw, and I think Rob Weiner also will probably go. Hmm, you know, that's a long that's a long way. I mean, it's a long way, but I just compelled by the fact that this it's a demonstrable thing for almost you know eight hundred years <laughs> that, that this is happening. Uh, the noble, I think this is the nobles doing this, and there's there's other evidence, you know, uh, documentary evidence from native stories about noble families moving from the south into Casas Grandes and they're described by the Spanish as kings. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, the nobles and then the commoners leave Chaco, just like, I, you know, the Acoma stories that they left Chaco, they reinvent themselves as Pueblos. Pueblos are reject, they're rejecting Chaco. They, they know what happened there. It was bad. They, they, they work very hard to not have nobles. <laughs> you know, they, they, that's not, it's not entirely easy to do that. Uh, so they, they, uh, it comes simpler. They make they deliberately make themselves simpler societies, um, and successfully they do it successfully until we show up. <laughs> oh, and then we just amplify the violence tenfold. Anything that happened prior got a wee bit dark. Well, he really was the toughest guy who ruled the roost, wasn't it? Yeah, I suppose if you are a noble and your families have been nobles for many generations, and you think you're different, I mean it, it, that's how it's, it works in Mesoamerica. Is that the commoners? Of course, the nobles are writing history, but nobles say we're divine. The commoners are not. You know, so we're, we're we're we may look like them, but we're really really a different sort of thing. We're we're not human like those guys are. We're you know, and so yeah, they they, they ran roughshod over all kinds of people all around the world at that time. Nobles identified with the sun. They they claimed they were noble through divine right. Yeah, it seems to be around the turn of the millennium. There, there was a great alignment for between nobles and the sun gods. That's what took over Khmer, Cambodia. Over nine hundred temples built within two hundred years, hmm. over five generations of rulers, and it was because the first was the first to say, "I am a king through divine law." Through, and again in Colombia when that happened. The Zipa, the or the Zaki in the north, the two rulers, they famously weren't even allowed to walk on the holy roads. They had to be lifted on golden carriages, and their feet could never touch the terrain yeah. because the the illusion that had to be perpetuated was that they were closer aligned with the sun god in the sky than they were with the filth on the earth. Yeah, well, I, I suspect Chaco wasn't quite that extreme. But it's a sort of watered down version of that, but I think it's a version of that. You know, I talked to Jim Pocketad about that. Who could tell me about that? Tim Pocketad. I'll, I'll send you his contact. He's the Cahokia guy that does is all entranced with lunar alignments at this point. Fascinating. I will definitely track him down. Good luck with your work. I can't thank you enough, Steve. It's just been so valuable. You've really laid it out in layman's terms as well, which I must thank you for especially. No, it's been fun talking to you. Enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, drop a five-star review or share it with a friend. And you can get in touch with me through HistoryFuzz.com.